Oh, really quick, 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 quick announcements today. Okay, um, if you have anything, our annual meeting is February 4th. If you have um, anything that you want to add on to the agenda, you need to let Pastor Michael or myself know right away. So let us know about that. Also, the soup cook-off, we have six people signed up. That is a... <sighs> A fundraiser for Honduras, and there we are. The youth are going. There's 35 going, and we are going to be working with 85, around 85 to 90 kids in there. And um, it's just a fun way to be together. It's a blast every time. So even if you do not want to make a soup, if you would want to come back and eat and um, just see who has the best soup, that'd be awesome. Um, also, Pizza with the Pastor is January 21st. If you are new here in the last couple weeks to six months, we would love for you guys to sign up, have pizza with us, and ask us any questions you want. You can test our Bible trivia. Wouldn't that be good? You can give all the answers. Okay. You. I'm just thinking, Kay, you're the one that just finished up schooling in Leeds, so there you go. Well, good morning, everyone, and I guess Happy New Year. I like that. My name is Michael Bachman. I'm the lead pastor, and I want to invite a special guest right now. Dory, if you want to come on up. So one thing we're going to be doing over the next several weeks is, you know, last Sunday, Ryan Rustad, one of our elders, talked about serving and finding places to get connected. And there's all kinds of ministries here in the church, and we're going to highlight a few, and also there's a few area ministries that are seeking to love in the name of Jesus in whatever way that we can serve. And one ministry that I'm so excited that we have here at Crosspoint is called Baby Bit. And Dory runs that, and I want to take a moment just to have Dory up here so that you can kind of hear what God is doing. So, Dory, can you start off by telling us, what is Baby Ben? What is Baby Ben? Well, that's a good question. It has to be where it started was in 2008, and that's when Roxanne Bartle was on her way to work and heard that the radio station in Fargo was having a baby shower, and she thought, well, why can't we do that? And thus started Baby Ben. So the first Tuesday of every month from 9 to 4 here in our fellowship hall, we have an opportunity for, if you are a WIC member, now WIC is W-I-C, Women, Infant, and Children, and if you are a WIC member, you can have a pack of diapers and a pack of wet wipes. If you are not a WIC member, then you can come and just take some clothing. And uh, we have very gently used clothing, and so that's what we're doing. We had 63 families that uh, we served last year, which is... Very low, really, when you consider our community. Very low. But we gave 215 packs of diapers and wipes, and that's what Baby Bend is. And it is really neat just seeing the people that God brings in uh, whenever you guys meet on Tuesdays. And many are from outside the church, and we have a chance to love them. Now, if someone wants to say, hey, that sounds great. I want to help in some way or support in some way, how can they do that? Okay, well, you see right here... I have um, my hands full. And, but anyway. <laughs> Here, let church, me move my Bible. The, the church provides the diapers and the wipes. And then if you are out uh, shopping and you want to pick up, uh, of course, these are brand new, which is wonderful. Wouldn't you love to come and just get something brand new for your baby instead of the garage sale item? But we take both. And so anyway. And then we have some ladies who make these beautiful things. So I don't do that. But they do. And so what a gift. Uh, but as far as helping, the first Monday of every month, we have a group of people that come and set up Baby Bin. And we put all the clothing out. So if you're free from uh, the first Monday of every month from 8 to 10. And then otherwise, really, what I would like you to do is tell people about Baby Bin. Because we have a wonderful ministry that no one else in our town has. And we want people to come. And so just tell them and then pray for them because it's scary to walk into a church. Um, some of you might know that. Uh, it's scary to walk in and think, what are they going to do? Are they going to try to, you know, what are they going to do? And what we're going to do is welcome them with a smile. And so just pray that God will continue to use this ministry. All right. And Dory, I, I want to pray over you. Uh, first, ushers, you can come forward, uh, prepare for an offering. And let's pray over Dory and over the service. 
Father, I want to thank you so much. Uh, going back 2008, how uh, you sparked this idea with rocks, and uh, years later, we have this minist- ministry functioning here that is just loving people in your name. And Lord, I want to thank you for Dory's leadership. I thank you for everyone that's involved with setting up and taking down and who donated items. And Father, we pray this ministry would continue to thrive and continue to point people toward you. And Lord, for Dory and all the leaders, may you just encourage them in every way. And Father, as we continue to go into an attitude of worship this morning, we just pray that you just manifest your presence and bless this time. We ask this in your name. Amen. 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 If you have any questions for Dory, uh, you can hunt her down after the service. Well, we're going to receive an offering. Uh, as the music starts, stay seated as the plate's making its way to the back. And when it's made its way to the back, Amy will have you stand. So let's enter into a time of worship.
lives. We were just, when we were praying this morning, one of the things that we were just praying out is that God, that his anointing would come, his power would come, and his power is strong. It's strong, it, it, it sets people free. It brings healing to broken hearts. It brings healing to broken bodies. And God, we just, we just welcome you into this place this morning. We just say, come and work in each person's life here.
student communion to come on up.
have all these songs and these words to try and describe your greatness, Lord. It doesn't come close. I just pray that you would, in this new year, give us a new sense of who you are, an even closer sense. I pray that as we learn from your word, you would humble us to receive what you have for us, that we would leave here ready to love the world, in your name. Amen. Thank you, team. I'd like to invite the kids to come forward right now. If you're new with us, we pray over the kids every week before they go to their kids' time. If you join me in prayer, Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for these children. And Lord, your greatness is far beyond what we can imagine. We could spend the rest of our lives singing praises and not even begin to describe you. And Father, may these kids fall in love with you. Bless them as they go to their kids' time. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, kids, we'll see you later. So over the weekend, my side of the family was visiting, and uh, we attempted one of those things that many have experienced before, that is no small feat for families, that of a family picture. And uh, you know what always happens, you get everyone together, especially hard with small kids, uh, you know, you, you set up the picture, you take the shot, someone has their eyes closed, you try again, this time the brother's poking the sister, and, you know, it takes about 10 tries. You all hate each other by the end, but you still got the smiles going on. So with our family, uh, Amy is the photographer, and she went and kind of positioned her phone to take the picture, put in the 10-second timer, ran on over to get in the back. First shot, my niece Brene is looking up at the sky somewhere. I know she's counting holes on the ceiling. I don't know. We tried again. Uh, we were short on time, so we ended up having to settle for this picture. You know, what, what a lovely family, except for you got Scotty right there who has something in mind far different than the camera. You know, I, this is a time of the year coming off of Christmas that if you're on social media, on Facebook, you see all kinds of different family pictures. And every family picture tells a story of a community of people that belong together and love each other. However, they often mask a reality going on behind the scenes. As perfect as those pictures look, they don't tell the story of brokenness. They don't tell the stories of conflict or grieving loss that takes place. They don't tell the story of parents who are just exhausted. Maybe they have toddlers that they're just trying to clean up after and more than anything, they just want to nap. Maybe it's parents of teenagers who are driving them all around town for different activities. The family pictures don't tell that story. Because the reality is, if you're part of a family, family can be very hard. A family is not for the faint at heart. One thing we have to recognize, though, is as difficult as family is, it is something that is very special to the heart of God. Now, you have, right in the beginning of Genesis, God invents the family. You have in Genesis 1 where God creates the first humans and we have more details in Genesis 2. You have Adam and Eve that God creates and he actually performs the first wedding. We have in Genesis 2.24, that is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and become one flesh. Marriage, we didn't invent it. God invented it. And in Genesis 1, do you know what the first command is that God gave to men and women? This, is, this marriage has happened. It was for them to have children, for them to multiply. See, again, family was invented by God. And it's sacred because throughout the Bible, God uses family to help us understand who God is and how we relate to him. We have again and again, God is presented as our heavenly father. If you are a follower of Jesus and you are his adopted children, 
Meaning that when a, a father is being a father the way he should, it should remind us of God's love. You know, mothers, uh, you have in the book of Psalms, David describes himself when he is trusting God of being like a weaned child leaning on his mother's chest. You have that image of the care of a mother. You have throughout scripture idea of us as Christians being brothers and sisters in the way that we relate to each other. The point is, family was created by God partially to help us understand who God is and how we relate to each other. Because of that, family is sacred. And one foundational thing for the next month is that God values the family as his sacred creation. In the midst of all the brokenness that the family has and all this dysfunction, it's considered sacred by God. And, and I recognize that in this room we have all kinds of different families. Uh, many of you are a part of what we call kind of the nuclear family, the two-parent home and the 2.7 kids. Uh, some of you are in homes in which there's been a death or maybe there's been divorce. M maybe you're, you're in a home in which maybe you're just single and you're on your own. And for every one of those, God has a special design. We see throughout the Bible, God talks about widows and orphans. But there is something special about the nuclear, what we call the nuclear family, in which all different aspects that point us back to God. And that's why over the next month, we're going to be talking about the family. Because if God cares about the family, then the family should matter to us. And I recognize family is a loaded topic. We could spend months talking about this. We're we'll focusing really on two main areas. We'll spend the next three weeks talking about parenting, and then we're going to reverse that and talk about parenting parents. Uh, there's, there are many of you that are in that place of life right now. And there's a few things I want to recognize before we get into this. First of all, while many of you are in the throes of parenting right now, there's many of you who aren't. I mean, you maybe, uh, maybe have grandparents here in which, yeah, you have children, but they're not living with you. They're out on their own. There's some of you that you have no kids of your own, but you're an aunt or an uncle, and that maybe you're, you're, you're single. Uh, we have different stories of life here. Some of you may even be like teenagers or college students that the idea of being a parent is far off in the horizon. And I recognize a series like this can be isolating in your, if you're in those different stages of life. I remember when I was single. I remember coming to church and there being parenting series and thinking, how in the world does this apply to me? And if that's you, here's what I want to challenge you with. I want to challenge you, challenge you with the idea that if you are part of the church and you are part of a community in which the health of everyone in this community is your vested interest. You know, Jesus once redefined family of saying his brothers and sisters were those who follow God. That means that for the marriages in our church, if you're single, healthy marriages, because we're as a family, healthy marriages are a victory for you. When marriages fail, it's a failure for all of us. Uh, in the home, when it comes to parenting, successful parenting is success for all of us. So from that standpoint, if you don't have kids at home, this series can maybe help you root and support those who do. And here's the other thing. When it comes to parenting, you may not have kids in your home, but most, if not all of you, have influence over children and teens in some way in your life. Maybe you are a grandparent. If you're a grandparent, a lot of things that I'm teaching about parenting just apply to your setting. If you have nieces or nephews, if you have younger siblings, uh, if you have neighbor kids, I don't know what it might be, apply it to your setting as a way that you can come alongside of families in this church. Here's another thing you should know. I, I would love to stand up here and teach on parenting as someone who could say, I'm a successful parent. And I'm not. I have not raised children into adulthood. I am not speaking to you from experience. I am in the middle of it. I have an 11-year-old, a 9-year-old, and a 7-year-old. I have odd children uh, for a few weeks yet till our next birthday. Uh, my point is, I'm still learning this myself, and what I'm sharing with you, really what does God's word say about parenting, and some of the wisdom of people who have studied this, and who do have some wisdom in that area. And this is not exhaustive. 
Uh, we're not going to spend uh, weeks and weeks about technical details of parenting. I'm trying to give you a few principles so we can make our home stronger, make our family stronger, and better be families that represent Jesus. So that's where we're going for the next few weeks. Before we get started this morning, let's pray. Fathers, we get into this topic. Uh, I know scattered around this room, we have all kinds of different people. And there are many who are exhausted, trying to hold it together right now. There are, are many who are grieving things that have happened in their lives. Uh, we have some that uh, they're trying to figure out how this even applies to them and how do they use this to minister to other parents in this room. And Father, I want to pray over the next few minutes that you would just give us a vision of what the home is meant to be of what you want us to be doing, where you want us to be prioritizing our time. And Father, perhaps for many of us, you may change our perspective in the next few minutes. We ask this in your name. Amen. So I, I'm calling this series The Picture Perfect Family, and I'm doing a little bit of a, a camera theme. I don't know if any of you know anything about photography. Uh, I do not know much, but my wife likes to dabble in photography. And I got the chance, before we moved here, she used to do photo shoots for a number of people. And I got to learn a little bit from watching her. And, you know, one of the most basic things about a photo shoot is you usually want to know what you're taking a picture of. You know, if you're doing graduation pictures, you should know that you're doing graduation pictures. You're not there looking at all the scenery. You're focusing on the, the teen you're taking the pictures of. And you want to set that scene because you want your end result to be as good as possible. You want your end result to match the target. Well, here's something about parenting. Wise parenting keeps the end goal in mind. Wise parenting sets the scene. It, it knows what kind of target they want to aim for and how they raise their kids. Now, if we're just to stop a random parent on the street, and this may include you, and ask, what is your goal in parenting? Many answers would be kind of like this. My goal is for my kids to survive and not get into trouble. Uh, there's been stages in my life with my kids in which that's really kind of been my goal. And there's been a number of surveys that have tried to figure out what are the targets that American families have. Back in the 1990s, they polled parents, and the, the number one answer that parents had was they wanted their kids to be successful. They wanted their kids to get good grades in school, to get into a good college, to get a good career, to make a lot of money, to make a name for themselves. Uh, that was the, the end goal. That's what they were aiming for. Uh, 20 years later, the same survey was done, and the answer had changed because parents realized they had a lot of successful kids who were not very happy about it. The aim then was to be kids who are happy. That whatever decision they make, that they're just happy with their lives. And that all sounds good, success sounds good, happiness sounds good, but do you know, that's not the target that God tells us to aim for. That's not the scene that God wants us to set. I want to show you a number of verses in the Bible that kind of help us get an idea of what God wants the home to aim for. We're going to start off in the book of Deuteronomy. Uh, Deuteronomy, this is uh, really kind of Moses' farewell address. The Israelite people are about to go into the promised land, and he's giving them his last words. He's instructing them on how they're supposed to live once they get into the land. He says this in Deuteronomy 4, 9. Only be careful and watch yourselves closely, so you do not forget the things your eyes have seen or let them fade from your hearts as long as you live. Now, what are their eyes seen? Uh, these are people who spent the last 40 years wandering through the desert, seeing God provide for them constantly. And God has been teaching them what it means to obey him, what it means to follow him. Look at this line. Teach them to your children and to their children after them. So they're supposed to be teaching what God has done to their children and to their grandkids. We've got that command right here. Let's skip ahead to 6, 6 to 7. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. So every opportunity to teach your kids these commands. And 
embedded in this, there's an end result that they're aiming at, that if this happens, God's going to do something. Deuteronomy 440. Keep his decrees and commands which I'm giving you today so that it may go well with you and your children after you and that you may live long in the land that the Lord your God gives you for all time. So if this were to happen, God's blessing would be attached to that. Now, you have multiple times it shows up in the Old Testament. I'm going to skip to the book of Proverbs. There's a passage that you may know quite well. Proverbs 22, 6. Start, off, start children off in the way that they should go. And even when they're old, they will not turn from it. Now, something about Proverbs, uh, there's a number of people that claim this as a promise. Uh, however, the book of Proverbs, wisdom, it's not meant to be a promise. It's meant to be a principle that most often when this is done, this is a result that happens. And if you start off, most often, if you start children off in the way that they should go, what does that mean? Well, this is with the Jewish people. They, they were... They fully would have read this into what Moses had taught them about God's commands. Start people off in that direction, and even when they're old, they will not turn from it. The idea you get in these verses, that you get throughout the Old Testament, is that God's intention was for the family to be an environment which was cultivating people who follow God. Now, you move in the New Testament. Now, in the New Testament, we shift a little bit because we recognize that Jesus is God in the flesh. You have what Paul says in Ephesians 6.4. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. We're going to get into that in a few weeks. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Then you have in Colossians, this is the next verse. It applies to everyone, not just parenting, but it includes parenting. He is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. Now, what do you get from this is, again, this idea that God has designed the home to be an environment that cultivates Christ followers. Now, may wonder, why is that such a big deal? Well, it is a big deal because of eternity. One thing the Bible teaches is every single one of us, and this includes our children, someday this life is going to end, and we're going to stand before God. And when we stand before God, God's not going to say, so tell me, how many football trophies did you get? Man, how, what position did you have in your law firm? Law firm. God's not going to ask those questions. He's not going to care about our accomplishments. He's not going to care about how big of a fish we got last week. What God's going to ask is, did we put our trust in him as our Savior? And what is our relationship with God like? In the end, that's what's going to matter. And that's what's going to last for eternity. Now, I recognize for some of you, what I'm saying right here may sound a little foreign. Uh, most of you here are Christ followers. Some of you are just exploring Christianity right now. And if that's you, first of all, I'm really glad you're here and what you need to know, what God wants more than anything is for you to know him and for you to celebrate with him forever. The problem is we've all rebelled against God. We all have sin in our lives, and what our sin does is it makes us an enemy of God. It means that what we deserve instead is eternal judgment. But God loved every one of us so much that he sent his only son, Jesus, into this world to die to take our punishment so that we could be forgiven. That by trusting in him, by uh, saying yes to his salvation, saying yes to following him, we can be forgiven of our sin and we can experience eternal life with him. And if you've never made that decision, I would encourage you, take that step today to say yes to following Jesus. And that's what God wants for your kids. That's the decision that lasts forever. Now, maybe you're getting that vision right now, saying, okay, that makes sense, that's what matters, but how? How do we get there? And that's really what the next several weeks are going to be about. How do you develop a home that's an environment that cultivates Christ followers? If you're a grandparent, if you're an aunt or uncle, if you're in a support role, how do you contribute to that? And this morning, I'm just going to give you something just to get us started. 
One of the first ways to do that is to uh, try to find some way of bringing spiritual conversations into the home. There was a, a study done several years ago in which um, a woman by the name of Jen Bradbury, and she wanted to try to figure out what, what is the spiritual health of teens? What contributes to teens knowing Christ and to stick with their faith following high school? And I, I've shared this with you before. Some of you might remember it. She was interested to see what are the greatest influences on a teen's walk with God. Now, study after study has shown that the number one influence on a child and a teenager's life is their parents. Parents win every time. But when it came to the question of your walk with God, most Christian teens didn't say their parents. Uh, most teens said, my youth pastor, my youth leader, uh, other Christian friends. And uh, Jen was kind of intrigued by that, so she kind of dug in a little bit further and asked, so why is that? And a lot of the teens said, well, I grew up in a Christian home, but my parents just never talked to me about Jesus. They would ask parents about them. Parents said, well, you know, we want our kids to know Christ, and that's why we bring them to church. The, the church has the, the paid professionals. Uh, we think the church is much better at that than we are. Now, here's the thing about that. I think the church is a vital research re resource. I love our youth ministry. I love what Kay does. But it is not the job of the church to disciple your kids. God gave that job to parents. There was a cartoon I saw a few years ago in which uh, this young man had been arrested. He was handcuffed. He was being put into a police car. And the mom is there weeping. And the mom says, my son, my son, my son, where did your youth pastor go wrong? Uh, no, no, that's, that's not the way to view that. And let me give you a practical reason too. Uh, right here, I don't know how well you can see this, but I, I have this tub that is full of ping pong balls. And every ping pong ball here represents one hour of the week. We have 168 hours during the week. And this involves a number of different things. Some of this is time spent sleeping. Uh, some of this is time that is spent at school, at the least during the school year. Maybe school sports are mixed in here. A lot of time here is time that kids spend at home with their parents. Now, uh, let's just say that your kids, let's say you have them at church every week. That's about one hour. Uh, let's say they go to youth group on Wednesday nights. That, that's an hour and a half, but I'll just represent one hour with that. Maybe if they're older, they go to the verse-by-verse -verse Bible study. That's another hour. So mixed in with all of this... We have three, I don't even know if you can see any of them. We have three blue balls in a sea of white. See, if we just decide the church is the only place where our kids are going to encounter Christ, then we're giving very little influence of Christ in their lives. And that's why parents, I want to encourage you, try to find ways to bring spiritual conversations into the home. And maybe here's a starting point, and some of you have already done this. Maybe sometime this week, take your kids aside and just answer this question. Why did you become a follower of Jesus? Or how did you become a follower of Jesus? Have your kids, have your kids ever heard that story? If they haven't, then share it with them. Grandparents, aunts and uncles, you can do that also. Just take a moment to share your story. And what it does, it just interjects some influence of Jesus in the home that can help create, help create this environment that cultivates Christ followers. You know, if maybe you're a teenager or a college student, you can have some fun and you can reverse that. Uh, you could just ask your parents, hey, Mom and dad, you know, and some of you come from non-Christian homes, so if that's the case, it won't work. But if you have Christian parents, just ask them. Say, hey, I've never heard your faith story. How do you become a Christian? Ask your parents that question and just see how they respond. And maybe you as a teenager might be the one that in some way brings more of Jesus into your home. If you have your notes, application step, introduce spiritual conversations into your home. Now, I do recognize in this room, 
There are many of you who are parents that you have kids that maybe you, try, you took this very seriously and you tried to bring Jesus into your home every chance that you had only to have your kids, after they graduate, walk away from their faith. I know there's many of you that deal with that right now and that you are grieving that. And as that is you, here's my encouragement for you. First of all, lean on the church community. I, I think that's got to be one of the most difficult things for any Christian parent to go through. Invite other people to join you in prayer. And then be encouraged by this. We have a God who loves your children more than you do, and we have a God who still restores. And as long as your children are still alive, their story isn't over yet. God is not done with that. And hold on to that hope. And let us pray together for God to reclaim their hearts and for God to bring them back. As we close, there's a story I want to share with you. Uh, there's a pastor named Wayne Cordero who shares this story in one of his books. Uh, he had a friend who, when he was in college, in order to graduate, had a major ter term paper he had to complete. So he spent weeks, I mean, going to the library almost every day, reading, taking notes, uh, putting this paper together, finally finished it. Some of you remember those days. Some of you are looking forward to those days, depending on your age. He finally got it turned in. What a great sigh of relief. Ah, <sighs> about to graduate. Three days later, the uh, papers returned from his professor, and there was a big note in red on the top. And it said this. It said, good research, great illustrations, wonderful bibliography, great F, wrong assignment. I don't know about you, but knowing that someday I'm going to stand before God I don't want to hear God say to me, hey, Michael, man, your kids did great at basketball. Great job at academics. They stayed out of trouble. But great F, wrong assignment. Because they weren't pointed toward Christ. Parents, if you have kids at home, set the scene. Make this the target. Make sure we get that assignment correct of being homes there are environments that are cultivating Christ followers. Grandparents, aunts and uncles, te teenagers, whatever your role is in the family. And family, it can, some of you are in some very difficult situations. Think of that target. Allow that to drive you to in some way bring more and more of Jesus into your home. And next few weeks, we're going to be talking about more how-tos. How do we do that better? Now, we're going to end this time. I want to invite Charlie and John to come up right now, reflecting that what enables us to do that, what, what makes it worthwhile to point our kids toward Christ is what God did for us through Jesus. I shared earlier, we, we deserve condemnation. We deserve punishment. But by the gift of Jesus and his sacrifice, the door is open for us and our children to celebrate with God forever. And Charlie's going to lead us into a time of communion as we remember and celebrate that. If I could have the ushers come forward, that'd be great. I think one of the things Michael's talking about this morning and relates really well to having communion today is the community that we're in and how we need to lean on the community that we're in here in church. Um... It can be tough if we're trying to go this alone. Um, our family has a couple older children and then teenagers. And I worry at times what type of legacy I'm, I'm leaving with them. And that can be tough. And especially if you're trying to do that on your own. And we don't want any of you here to feel like you're trying to do that on your own. There's people here you can talk to. We're here as a family to do this together. And that's something that Jesus led by example with his disciples. And I don't think we can fully ever understand the sacrifice that he made for us on the cross so that once we give our lives to Jesus, we can be forgiven and be with him for eternity. And that's part of the legacy that I want to leave for my kids and for my family. 
And I pray that that's something that everybody here wants to do. If you guys want to start passing the elements out, um, hold them and we'll pray at the end and take them together. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for the sacrifice that you made on the cross that day, for all the things that you did ahead of time before that day to help give us examples of how we're supposed to lead and how we're supposed to be family, Lord, and all the examples that are in the Bible. Lord, let us dig in. Let us not ever feel alone. Let us remember that we are a part of a, a giant family of believers 
and that we can lean into those believers for guidance too and never never need to feel alone. But you are always there, Lord. The Holy Spirit is always there for us. We just have to sometimes be still enough to hear that voice and to listen and to be willing to listen, Lord. Lord, let the legacy that we leave here be one that remembers you, not that remembers us, but, but that we led people to you and that we pointed people in your direction, Lord. What we do here doesn't matter. We, we want to be with eternity and eternity with you, Lord Jesus. Lord, we just thank you. And Lord, we take these elements in remembrance of you. Again, Lord, thank you for all you've, all you've done in the past for us and all that you will do in the future for us. In your holy name we pray, amen. You have a great week.